My name is Robert Miller. I am the F. Paul Down Chair of Corporate Finance and Law here at the University of Iowa College of Law. It is my pleasure today to welcome you to the University of Iowa's 2022 James Fraser Smith Lecture. James Fraser Smith graduated from this college in 1950, and he later established uh, this lecture in order to bring eminent jurists to speak on topics of interest to the College of Law. Now, this year's James Fraser Smith Lecturer, Vice Chancellor J. J. Travis Laster of the Delaware Court of Chancery, is most certainly an eminent jurist. But before speaking about the Vice Chancellor, I want to say a few words about his court. Now, I know most of you know, but perhaps some of you in the audience do not, that the Delaware Court of Chancery is the most important corporate law court in the world. Essentially, every important corporate law case in the United States comes through the Court of Chancery. The reason for this is that there are so many corporations incorporated in Delaware, so many limited liability companies chartered in Delaware. Indeed, more than half of all the public companies in the United States are incorporated in Delaware. And no other jurisdiction has more than a handful of such entities. In the rare instances, when a court outside of Delaware hears an important court in a case, judges in such cases tend very strongly to look to Delaware to see you know, what presidential, or not presidential, I suppose persuasive authorities they should follow. The reach of Delaware therefore goes far beyond Delaware entities. Even outside the United States, commercial courts tend to look to Delaware. The commercial court of the United Kingdom, for example, routinely cites precedents in Delaware, as do similar courts in Canada and Australia and other courts throughout the English speaking world. It is thus not too much to say that geographically small Delaware is in the business of providing corporate law to the United States of America and the commercial and corporate law to a good part of the world. But why Delaware? Occasionally, someone will say that Delaware laws are very favorable to management, officers and the directors, and thus these people want to have their entities incorporated in Delaware for their personal benefit. This is manifestly false. For one thing, there are many states in the Union, Pennsylvania comes to mind, that have laws much more favorable to management than Delaware does, and it's rare for people to incorporate in Pennsylvania. More importantly, shareholders, including the most sophisticated institutional shareholders with trillions of dollars under management, want to invest in corporations chartered in Delaware. They want this precisely because they know that in Delaware, they will get a fair hearing, not a hometown court bent on protecting one of the three or four major corporations incorporated in their state. In other words, the reason that all well-advised companies incorporated in Delaware is the Delaware Court of Chancery, most particularly its judges. For several decades now, all manner of academic studies and surveys of practitioners have routinely determined Delaware to be the best court system in the United States. It gets especially high marks for the impartiality and competence of its judges and the predictability of its results. A short story will illustrate this point. I used to chair the Corporation Law Committee of the New York City Bar Association. We received a presentation one time from a lawyer who was in the process of lobbying the New York legislature to amend the New York Limited Liability Company Act to improve it in various ways. And he wanted our opinion on what changes ought to be made to the New York LLC Act. And we spent an hour or two with this, with this gentleman and we explained what we thought should the changes, the changes should be, all the members of this committee being partners at elite New York law firms. When we were all done, the man asked us, if the legislature were to make these changes, would you advise your clients to incorporate in New York or form LLCs in New York? And there was an awkward silence. And then finally, everyone said, no. And he said, but why not? And then there was a slightly more awkward silence. And finally, uh, an attorney from Wachtell Lipton said, if there's a dispute, 
we don't want some random trial judge from New York to decide, we want Travis Laster. And that brings me to our speaker. Travis Laster was born in Virginia. He attended Princeton University where he graduated summa cum laude with a degree in classics. He then earned his master's degree and a law degree at the University of Virginia, where he was an editor of the Virginia Law Review and received the prize for the most outstanding academic record in his law school class. After graduating, he clerked for Judge Jay Roth in the United States Court of Appeal for the Third Circuit, and then joined the leading Delaware firm of Richard Slate and Finger, where he became a partner and a director in the firm's corporate department. He then co-founded his own firm, Abrams and Laster, doing high stakes corporate litigation in naturally the Delaware Court of Chancellor. In 2009, he was appointed a vice chancellor on the Court of Chancery, and he's now the longest serving sitting judge on that court having been recently reappointed to a second 12 year term. In his almost 13 years on the court, he has authored more than 350 opinions, including very influential opinions on such matters as material adverse effect clauses and the ordinary course covenant and public company merger agreements, the relationship of preferred and common stock and the fiduciary duties of directors when they have both preferred and common shareholders, the limits on a company's ability to repurchase shares, from its shareholders, forum selection clauses, controlling shareholder transactions, the duty of investment bankers, the duties of activist shareholders when they are elected to the company's board, and the interpretation of indentures. He's also published more than 20 scholarly articles on corporate law. Given his long tenure on chancery and the breadth and influence of his many opinions, there can be little dispute that Vice Chancellor Laster is the most important corporate law judge in the world. In the last few years, he's decided several cases in which attorneys for some very elite law firms have engaged in some very bad behavior. He will be speaking to us today about those cases in a lecture entitled Big Firm Ethics. Please join me in welcoming Vice Chancellor Travis Laster. Uh, well, thank you very much for that introduction, Robert. I appreciate it. It was uh, very flattering. I, I assume that uh, hyperbole and in introductions is a necessity. I have to disagree with the most important law judge in the world point. I can guarantee you I will be reversed next time if I get that, if I were to let that slide. Uh, while I'm at it, the Delaware Supreme Court is the most important corporate court in the world. We are just uh, trial judges. All right. Having gotten uh, that, that correction out of the way, uh, it's great to be here and it's great to see you all. And uh, I do understand that this is being broadcast via Zoom. So uh, it's great to anyone who's attending uh, uh, remotely. Um, I'm very appreciative uh, to Dean Kevin Washburn of the Iowa Law School and to Professor Miller uh, for inviting me to speak. Uh, I was here uh, several years ago to give a talk on the famous, some might say infamous, Delaware Supreme Court case called Omnicare. Uh, it's uh, Good to be back and my timing seems particularly fortuitous. Uh, I have the impression that after two pandemic filled years where there haven't been any visitors at the law school, you all are desperate to see a real live person. Uh, and I have uh, benefited from your hospitality. It's like someone finding castaways on a desert island. So yes, Hawkeyes, there is still an outside world and I'm here as, as living proof. Uh, so I'm especially honored to give the James Frazier Smith lecture, uh, which, as I understand, one of the purposes of the letter of the lecture is to encourage interest in litigation and to give students exposure to issues and challenges that litigators face. Um, as a trial judge who serves on the Delaware Court of Chancery, Overseeing litigation is what I do. It's really all I do. Uh, my colleagues and I issue decisions at every phase of the litigation process, uh, ranging from emergency applications at the beginning of a case to post-trial rulings at the end of the case. Um, moreover, the Court of Chancery is a court of equity, which means that we sit uh, without juries. 
Uh, so what that means is that from the time the case is assigned to me all the way through the end, uh, I am the sole decision maker. Uh, of course, uh, absent any appeal uh, at the end of the case or interlocutory appeals during the case. But I am, I am the one who is making these uh, decisions about the case. Uh, so I feel uh, at least qualified to talk to you about some of the challenges involved in litigation. And I suspect that the, the reason that I'm here is because some of my judicial opinions uh, intersect with Professor Miller's uh, scholarly interests. So outside the corporate law world, a material adverse effect is an esoteric concept. Um, the corporate cognoscenti, often abbreviated as MAE. Uh, MAEs are not something that ordinary people discuss. And it's not because of any scandal or controversy. It's just that MAEs aren't part of daily life. But when you are dealing with an 80 to 100 page merger agreement governing a multi-billion dollar transaction, uh, then the MAE plays a major role. Generally speaking, if the target suffers an MAE, then the buyer doesn't have to close. The buyer doesn't have to complete the transaction. When a buyer seeks to terminate uh, a deal uh, or tries to renegotiate a deal, it's often because the buyer believes that the target has suffered an MAE. Framed for purposes of litigation, what this means is the buyer and its counsel believe that they can credibly assert that the target has suffered an MAE, thereby creating meaningful litigation risk. Uh, that in turn creates the leverage necessary for a potential renegotiation. Uh, now I'm gonna return some of the compliments. I think it's no understatement that uh, Professor Miller is the preeminent scholar on MAEs. There are other folks who have written on it to be sure, uh, but no one has parsed the clause so helpfully for judges like me uh, who have to decide uh, these types of cases and work through the, the dense prose that uh, comprise the clause. Um, so I have written three lengthy opinions on multi-billion dollar MAE deals. Uh, one of my colleagues calls them the A trilogy because of the first letter of their names, Anthem, Acorn, and AB Stable. Uh, in each of those decisions, I relied heavily on Professor Miller's uh, work. And so if I had to bet, I would think he probably invited me here so that we could geek out as contract nerds and talk about MAE clauses and you know, have, have some good fun uh, that way. Um, but something happened on the way to that speech. Uh, and what happened was I received a, a call from a reporter from the Financial Times. And he observed that in each of the decisions of the, in the A trilogy, the lawyers emerged as key players in the drama and not as heroes. Each decision depicted the lawyers behaving aggressively, behaving badly. And these weren't solo or small firm practitioners who might be expected from time to time to get in over their heads, particularly on a big multi-billion dollar deal. These were some of the biggest and most prestigious firms in the legal profession. Cravath, Swain and Moore, Wachtell Lipton, White and Case, Gibson Dunn. These are the, the cream of the crop. These are the, the top drawer shops. So the reporter asked me, is, is, is this a trend? Are you trying to send a message to big law? Before his call, I had not focused on this through line, but once he pointed it out, I had to admit that it was obviously there. And I had to ask myself, you know, what, what is going on here? Um, I can attest that I wasn't consciously trying to send a message to big law. Uh, instead, in, in my role as a judge, and particularly in my role as fact finder, um, I tried to lay out what I think really happened, including the dynamics that lead uh, to the eventual uh, triggering result uh, for the case. Um, I therefore describe what I candidly thought the lawyers were doing. And in each case, the behavior wasn't exemplary. 
Now, it's important to acknowledge at this point that I do not claim to see through a glass clearly. I am confident that none of the participants in those cases think that I got everything right. Uh, and I am especially confident that the lawyers in question disagree mightily uh, with my findings and criticisms. But they were my findings. And for purposes of today, I'm going to base uh, my comments on my factual findings uh, as set forth in uh, those judicial decisions. So accepting those findings as true, I think it's worth asking, is, is something going on here? What, what is happening? Is this something that judges or the judiciary collectively should worry about? Is this a, a matter of social concern? So I want now to move from the abstract to the concrete. Let's take an example. Uh, let's use the ACORN case, which is one of the decisions in the A trilogy. I'm only going to give you a glimpse of the story. Uh, the ACORN case was a factually complex decision that spanned 246 pages. I regret burdening the world with it. Uh, <laughs> We're going to focus on one part of that story, uh, and we're going to view it in three acts. So let's first uh, set the, the basic stage. Uh, the Acorn case uh, uh, started out as a standard M&A transaction. The buyer was an entity called Fresenius, a German healthcare conglomerate. The target was Acorn, a gener generic pharmaceutical company, and as such was regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Fresenius and Acorn signed a merger agreement in which Fresenius agreed to pay top dollar. Uh, uh, Acorn repped in that agreement that it was in compliance with all its uh, regulatory requirements. Uh, so essentially they were promising Fresenius to deliver a company uh, that was doing what it should do and was compliant uh, uh, in all ways, uh, except the extent the deviation would give rise to that MAE. Um, during the period between signing and closing, Fresenius received two whistleblower letters. Those letters made disturbing allegations about Acorn's product development process. They asserted that it wasn't in compliance with FDA regulations, and they particularly focused on Acorn's data integrity uh, processes. Fresenius provided the letters to Acorn. In doing so, Fresenius expected that ACORN would want to conduct its own internal investigation. Fresenius conveyed that in addition to the investigation that it expected ACORN would conduct, Fresenius felt the need to conduct its own investigation, relying on a provision in the transaction agreement that gave it access to the books and records of the target company. ACORN shared the letters with its board of directors. One of those directors had a lot of FDA experience. He looked at the letters and he said, the FDA would take this very seriously. They would have serious concerns. So for our first act, put yourself in the shoes of ACORN and its legal team. Confronted with this, what would you do? Now start out by asking yourself, what would you do on a clear day if you were not subject to a transaction agreement and if you received these types of whistleblow letters? Let's take the big question first. Would you conduct an internal investigation? If you think you would, who would you use to conduct that investigation? Would you hire counsel with expertise in FDA matters? Would you hire counsel with expertise in data integrity and product development issues, the subject of the whistleblower letters? All right, now stop and think, would you, what would you do in this position if your company was being sold so that soon all of this would be someone else's problem? And now let's tweak a little bit more what would you do if your company was being sold so soon it would be somebody else's problem, but you were bound by a contract that required you to operate in the ordinary course of business between signing and closing? In other words, do what you would normally do. And now, would you do anything differently if the other side of the deal for Senius said it was going to conduct 
its own investigation. Right. So think in your mind what the answers to those questions might be. And I'm gonna now tell you what ACORN and its legal team actually did. First, ACORN did not conduct its own investigation. They chose not to conduct an investigation of their own. Instead, they decided to have their deal counsel, Cravath, help them out. Now, Cravath is one of the world's most sophisticated law firms, no question. But it is not a firm with expertise in FDA matters or data integrity issues. Not only that, but Cravath in this setting was deal counsel. They were there to help the deal get done. So Cravath uh, fielded a team led by a litigation partner. Now that partner had previously worked for the SEC. He had experience conducting internal investigations. He knew how to conduct an internal investigation, no doubt. But he had never conducted a data integrity investigation for a pharmaceutical company, had never appeared before the FDA, and had no familiarity with FDA rules, regulations, or administrative guidance. And what did ACORN task the Cravath team with doing? And then what did the Cravath team do? Again, it, it wasn't to conduct an investigation. It was to monitor the investigation that Fresenius was conducting. Really, it was to front run that investigation, to go to the sites that Fresenius was going to visit, to meet with the employees there, to engage in witness prep at those sites, and to head off any problems that might emerge. Meanwhile, what did Fresenius do? Remember, this was gonna be Fresenius's problem. Fresenius hired FDA enforce, the FDA Enforcement and Compliance Group at another major law firm. The partner leading that team specialized in FDA enforcement and compliance. Fresenius also hired consultants with technical expertise who could evaluate the issues that the whistleblowers raised. Uh, the scientist who led that team had over 40 years of experience in the pharmaceutical in industry. He ultimately testified at trial. I judged him to be one of the most credible witnesses I've ever seen in court. This guy was an absolute straight shooter. Call it like you see it, no matter what the consequences are. So between Acorn and Fresenius, you have two very different approaches, two polar opposite approaches. From Fresenius, you have a real investigation geared at finding problems. I suspect that if Acorn wasn't being sold, that's what Acorn management would have done. They would have had an incentive to do that same thing because it would have been their problem. They would have wanted to find it out, find out what it was. But in the context of the deal, Acorn had different incentives. Acorn wanted to get to closing and make it somebody else's problem. And it seems to me like the, the legal team channeled that business goal, went along with it, and enabled it. The legal team went out to perform the mission of not only not finding problems, but helping to make sure that Fresenius didn't find problems. This was a a pseudo investigation focused on damage control, focused on preemptive cover up. It was not a, a, a fact finding uh, process. All right, now let's let's move to the second act because it turns out that the situation was was too bad uh, for that uh, approach to work. During one site visit. While preparing Acorn's witnesses to meet with the Fresenius team, um, Cravath learned about specific problems with the data supporting a particular drug application. The director of quality control for that site was a woman named Mispa Sherwani. She told the Cravath attorneys that Mark Silverberg, who was the overall head of Acorn's quality and compliance function, the, the top guy in quality and compliance, had signed off on a submission to the FDA that he knew contained false data. This is a real problem. At that point, Cravath held off the Fresenius team 
said, we're canceling your site visit. You can't come talk to these people. And they started conducting an actual investigation to figure out what really went on. Two days after Cravath started investigating, Silverberg went to Shirwani to discuss the incident. So the head guy went to the person who was raising this problem. Shirwani immediately called an associate at Cravath and told the associate that she was uncomfortable being in the same room with Silverberg that he was telling her to do things with the documentation of the incident and that he was discussing inaccurate justifications that they could come up with. And most strikingly, he said that he would eat the drafts of the explanation that they developed. The associate thought this was a problem. The associate called the lead Cravath partner. The lead Cravath partner spoke by phone with Silverberg and he also spoke by phone with Shirwani. At trial, the Cravath partner testified. He said that the phrase eat the drafts did not mean anything to him. He said that uh, he quickly dismissed this as uh, a simple misunderstanding between Shirwani and Silverberg. Eat the draft sounded to me like a fairly obvious reference to how you'd coordinate stories, document the story, and get rid of the evidence that you'd coordinate stories. That was how Sherwani understood it. She said that's exactly what Silverberg was trying to do. Now, Cravath spent approximately eight weeks investigating the claims about the fabricated data. The resulting record established that Shirwani and another colleague had told Silverberg that the data supporting the FDA submission was fabricated, was fabricated, and that they had told him not to submit the data to the FDA. Silverberg told them that ACORN was not going to do that. Silverberg instructed Shirwani not to document anything. Then when Shirwani was out of the office, Silverberg signed her named the application and submitted the data. All right, so let's assume that you have uncovered all this information uh, through your investigation. Now put yourself in the shoes of Acorn's legal team. You still want the deal to close. You still want Fresenius to believe everything is okay and not to think there's a serious problem. You especially don't want the FDA to get wind of this and think there might be a serious problem. So what do you do? What do you do? All right. Well, to their credit, at this point, ACORN and its legal team took some steps to address the problem. I think what happened is a switch flipped. Jonathan Haidt has a helpful heuristic for uh, uh, understanding how our minds approach new information. When there's something we want to believe, we tend to ask, is this something that I can believe? We ask ourselves, can I believe this? When we encounter something that we resist, when we encounter something that we don't want to believe, we tend to ask ourselves, must I believe this? I think when the initial whistleblower letters came in, the legal team's reaction was, can I believe that everything is okay? Can I believe that we don't really have a problem? Yes, I can believe that. And so they went down the path they did where the goal was to confirm that they did not actually have a problem. Once you had this instance with Shivani and Silverberg, I think that switch flipped. The issue was now, we must believe that we have a problem. How do we deal with the problem and, and still get to close it? All right. So what ACORN did at this point was some things that I think evidence uh, uh, what they might've done earlier. Uh, first, they hired counsel with specific FDA expertise. Next and most significantly, they decided to self-report to the FDA. Um, they also constructively terminated Silverberg by moving him to a new position with lower salary and no 
independent responsibilities. And the reason they did that is because they understood from FDA counsel that that was the type of thing that the FDA would want to see in a case of deliberate misconduct. So ACORN's response thus suggested that indeed they thought that uh, there was willful misconduct, that there was deliberate misconduct going on, or at least that the facts could be interpreted that way. ACORN also gave a report to Fresenius, the lead Crefath partner, the one we've talked about before, told Fresenius that Silverberg's explanations of why he acted were not satisfactory and didn't hang together. And he also told Fresenius that he would not rely on those explanations to defend ACORN before the FDA. So Silverberg had said, I didn't know that the data was false. And what the Cravath partner told Fresenius is in substance, I don't believe that. And I won't rely on that when we go to self-report for the FDA. Internally, the lead partner said that there was a high likelihood that the FDA would conclude giving the trail of documentary evidence that Silverberg acted with intent. All right. So now, uh, Let's enter the third and final act, which really focuses on ACORN's meeting uh, with the FDA with the goal of self-reporting on ACORN's difficulties. Um, that effort started with a back-channel communication to the FDA. The day before a big in-person meeting, a lawyer from ACORN's regulatory law firm had what they called a sidebar call with an FDA representative. And during that call, the lawyer denigrated Fresenius' motives. They said, look, this is really just a dispute between the merger parters, part, uh, parties. And he suggested that, that uh, Fresenius would try to call into question ACORN's presentation and what it had done and that the FDA really shouldn't listen to that. Um, we, have the, we had the talking points in the record uh, uh, that the lawyer used when talking to the FDA, and, and they contain notable inaccuracies. This was a, a spun account to, to prepare the, for the meeting. Uh, the, the meeting itself was a big meeting. There were eight uh, ACORN representatives, including ACORN's counsel and the lead Cravath partner, and there were 16 folks from the FDA there. The Cravath partner took the lead, and he made a PowerPoint presentation and also gave oral remarks. Now, the, the evidence at trial showed that that presentation was misleading in several ways. First, the presentation depicted the investigation into the whistleblower letters as if it was a joint investigation from the start. Now, remember that that wasn't true. ACORN hadn't conducted an investigation into the whistleblower letters. ACORN had just front run the Fresenius investigation, and it wasn't until this specific incident came up that ACORN actually started uh, investigating. As part of that, the presentation cited investigation that Fresenius had done and took credit for it and claimed it was ACORN's work. Second, ACORN presented the investigation into the false data incident as if that had been a joint investigation. What really happened is Fresenius wasn't involved in that. That was entirely uh, an ACORN show. ACORN also represented that during that part of the investigation, ACORN's quality control function was thoroughly involved when in fact the quality control function had been kept on the sidelines. Now, worst of all, the presentation adopted Silverberg's explanation for the false submission. Under a heading investigative findings, so the findings of the investigation, the presentation stated that Silverberg authorized the submission without knowing that the data, that the false data would be submitted. And the evidence showed that during the meeting, the Cravath partner called the FDA's attention to this statement, singled it out, made a point of, of uh, bringing it to the FDA's attention. Now, this was, this was the same person who had earlier told Fresenius that he didn't find that explanation satisfactory and that he wouldn't rely on it to defend the company's conduct to the FDA. Um, at trial, ACORN's expert on this process, this is, the, this is the expert that is supposed to justify what ACORN did, gave a fairly striking concession. Um, 
the expert said that ACORN was not fully transparent with the FDA during the meeting. All right, so for purposes of our discussion today, uh, those are the key parts of the case. We're not particularly interested in the outcome on the deal event. Uh, I will tell you that in the end, I upheld Fresenius's termination of the merger agreement on multiple grounds, uh, including that ACORN had failed to conduct its operations in the ordinary course by submitting the false data to the FDA and by failing to conduct a meaningful investigation and by providing the false information uh, to the FDA. Um, there's no question that the behavior of ACORN's legal team during this process contributed to that. They were a key part of those findings. It was the legal team that did not conduct the meaningful investigation. Uh, it was the legal team that prepared the misleading presentation uh, to the FDA. Uh, and it was the, the big law partner from one of the world's preeminent firms that provided the misleading information to the FDA. Now let's have a, a side note here on the other two cases. Um, I will tell you that the other two decisions in the A trilogy involved uh, uh, at least similarly extreme and in, in one instance, uh, even more extreme versions of lawyers either hiding facts, uh, making misrepresentations or manufacturing an inaccurate account. Uh, the facts of those cases are, are quite complex. We could spend all our time just working up the examples. Uh, and I want to uh, uh, stop with the glimpse of ACORN and, and talk about some of the things that I think this suggests to me and, and where we go from here. So I asked at the outset whether this type of behavior from big law is a problem that I and other judges should be worried about. I think the answer to that question is self-evident. I think it absolutely is. Um, let's start with the scope of the problem. The lesson I draw from the lawyer's actions in the A trilogy is that under the wrong circumstances, anyone can be complicit. So I've, I've talked about this Cravath partner a lot. Let me, let me tell you a different side of it. He is a guy with an outstanding employment and educational pedigree. He showed up at trial. He testified. I got to see him live and judge his credibility. I am confident that he is an upright and moral person in every sense of the word. He's, he's the kind of person that if you found out he was coaching your kid's team or something like that, you would be thrilled. I think he's somebody who strives to do the right thing. Yet under the the pressure of a contested deal when the client was pushing for an outcome, I think he buckled. And in the context of giving a presentation to the FDA, a big presentation in front of his whole team, I think he abandoned his own convictions, his own beliefs about what happened and was willing to present a false narrative that he had previously said he would not endorse. Now, look, that should be humbling to all of us. It means that none of us are immune. Any of us could potentially be in that situation. And the ACORN case, as I've said, isn't an outlier. Um, I've already told you the, the caliber of the firms and the AB Stable and Anthem Cigna case. The lawyers in those cases were absolute leaders in their fields. Yet they all engaged in the type of behavior that I spelled out uh, in those decisions. Now, to me, that says that we cannot dismiss these instances as a few bad apples. It, it rather seems to me indicative of a type of pushing of the envelope on truthfulness that is an indication of what the big law barrel contains. What that also means to me is that we shouldn't think that the issues that were called out in the A trilogy, the issues that the litigation process revealed in the A trilogy, are isolated or exceptional. We actually should be worried that they are, again, indicative that this is the type of thing that is going on all the time and that normally you don't have the process of hard-fought, well-funded litigation in which somebody uncovers what actually happened. 
All right. So, so now let's talk about whether this problem is actually serious. Is this something that we ought to worry about, or is this just you know a little bit of puffery or or bending of the truth? I think the conduct I have described is not ambiguous stuff at all. There are some close calls under the ethics rules, but misrepresentation isn't one of them. A lawyer has a basic obligation to be truthful and to counsel her client to be truthful. So I'm gonna use the model rules. The model rules are what we've adopted in Delaware. They're adopted in most states. Rule 1.2D says that, and I'm gonna quote, a lawyer shall not counsel a client to engage or assist a client in conduct that the lawyer knows is criminal or fraudulent. Rule 3.3A covers candor to the tribunal. It says, a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of fact or law to a tribunal or fail to correct a false statement of material fact or law previously made to the tribunal by the lawyer. And finally, rule 4.1 says, in the course of representing a client, a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of material fact or law to a third person. So that, that pretty much covers the bases. In the example from ACORN that I have described, by the time we got to the FDA meeting, you had a false statement of material fact being made to a government agency. You had several false statements of material fact being made to a government agency. Um, and it was knowing because we had the prior statements from this individual about what he believed. He did not believe Silverberg. And he said he wasn't going to advance that account. He then abandoned those positions and relied on Silverberg's account while at the same time misrepresenting the nature of Acorn's actions. But I don't care which bucket you want to put this in. I'm not terribly worried about debating whether the FDA is a tribunal or not, or whether it's a third party. Uh, I think what we have here is a pretty uh, clean problem on a pretty clean issue. Um, if, if we were to digress in the AB stable case, there we had a series of false and misleading statements. I mean, I went so far as to say that the lawyers committed fraud about fraud because the fraud involved some deeds that were themselves fraudulent. And the case also involved issues of candor to the tribunal. Um, so what this says to me is that we actually have a real problem. And what we have is uh, uh, indications that big firm lawyers who are otherwise outstanding examples in their field and who otherwise we would see no reason to question who are nevertheless willing to be untruthful when it advances the client's interests. For a court that oversees litigation, this is quite worrisome. Um, the common law has a maxim, fraus omnia vitiat, that is Latin for fraud destroys everything. And that's because it does. Accurate information, shared facts, shared understanding, those are the keys to communication. Those are the keys to accurate decision making. Those are the keys to how we operate in the world. Without accurate information, we can't do any of those things. The problems are even bigger for litigation. Litigation largely takes place outside of the view of the judge. Discovery takes place almost entirely outside the view of the judge. It is an adversary-driven process. For that process to work, lawyers have to be honest about what they are doing in discovery. They have to be honest about what documents and information they have. They have to be honest about what documents and information they are providing. They have to be honest about what documents and information they are withholding. Then when the judge gets involved, I can't conduct my own investigation to figure out what actually went on. I have to rely to a significant degree on what the lawyers tell me about what they did and what they produced. If that information lacks integrity, the entire process breaks down. And now let's step back and think about society 
as a whole, where I think a breakdown in lawyer integrity is an even bigger problem. People like to tell jokes about lawyers, and tease lawyers, but let's face it, lawyers occupy a very special place in a country that prides itself on having a government of laws and not of men. Our legal system depends on a high level of voluntary law compliance. We simply can't have, if we wanna live in a free society, enforcement agents looking over everyone's shoulder. And lawyers are critical in guiding people to the, route, right, to the right outcome. We're not in a good place if lawyers become law evaders. All right, so I've painted a, a dim picture and now let's, let's talk about the why. Why might this be happening? Um, I've stated already, and, and I maintain that it's not possible to dismiss ACORN uh, or the other cases in the A trilogy as just a, a few bad apples. But that is, uh, a, you know, the one consequence of that is disturbing. It suggests that we have a bunch of psychopaths walking, walking around in the big law firm community. Um, I'm not willing to accept that either. I, you know, I, I see these people, I interact with these people. I know that these are, are fundamentally good people. So we need some explanation for this behavior that does not depend on malice. Um, here, I think the scholarship of Professor Don Langevoort at, at Georgetown provides helpful insight. Uh, he relies on a number of insights from behavioral psychology uh, to argue that it's not always easy for lawyers to spot wrongdoing, even when the line seems obvious in hindsight. And that's because the ability of the human brain to recognize a threat of wrongdoing, the risk of wrongdoing in real time is heavily influenced by multiple factors that include situational dynamics, cultural norms, your own past experience and peer behavior. So let's talk about some of these. For, for big firm lawyers, the most obvious situational dynamic is that the client pays the bills. So the lawyer has an interest in doing what the client wants. If not, the client will go elsewhere. We all know that the pressure to generate business and retain a client is significant, and that may result in a lawyer viewing matters from the client's perspective when an objective observer would not. Now, I think that's a compelling argument, and I think it does play a role in many cases. But part of what's interesting to me about the A trilogy is you have firms at the apex of the profession. They have enjoyed so much success that these are outfits that should not be beholden to any individual client. I don't have detailed insight into the internal dynamics of the firm or whether individual partners might be affected uh, differently uh, because of uh, compensation models or things like that. But you know, Cravath is widely known to have a lockstep compensation system. And you would think that would dull to some degree this, this uh, idea that it's economic pressure. So I think this is a, this is a factor, but it's at best a, a somewhat crass and, and a partial explanation. I think a more subtle and significant situational dynamic is that the lawyer's interests are aligned with the client simply because the lawyer sees themselves as representing the client. The lawyer is supposed to be looking out for the client and achieving the client's business goals. The lawyer is not supposed to be looking out for the other side of the deal. The premise is that we let the other side look out for themselves. If they have lawyers, great. The lawyer, those lawyers can look out for them. And if they don't, well, that's their problem. Um, what I suspect this does is it really imports into the concept of morals, the morals of the marketplace. And it involves the lawyers simply acting as another market actor rather than a profession with a higher uh, ethical duty of the type that I outlined previously. Um, I think that we may have seen this type of situational dynamic playing out in the ACORN scenario when Cravath agreed to conduct this pseudo investigation that really was aimed at, at covering up any problems and thereby serving the client's goals. Um, it's really hard for me to believe that Cravath didn't advise ACORN to run a real investigation. Um, 
But I'm also confident, or I, I would suspect that what Acorn told Cravath is we don't want to do that. And I think once uh, Cravath got that response, they likely aligned on conducting this cover up rather than, or this cover up investigation rather than a real investigation. Um, and I think it, it, it aligned with the idea that Cravath was hired as the deal lawyer, hired to get the company sold. Uh, and uh, in that situation, uh, there was a close uh, alignment that, that promoted Cravath doing uh, what its client wanted. Now let's add the perceived cultural norm in the legal profession that the lawyer should act as the zealous advocate for the client. That perception, I think, can give rise to what I think of as a concept of altruistic extremism. Altruism is when you're acting on behalf of another. And when you think about the types of, of things humans do when we are acting on behalf of another, it, it is ennobling. It's ennobling to go to the extreme on behalf of another. Think of, of, of soldiers uh, sacrificing themselves for their platoons or engaging in, in serious acts of bravery on behalf of their comrades. Uh, think of uh, a, a parent putting themselves at risk for the child. I suspect that this operates uh, for lawyers as well, and that lawyers feel able, indeed empowered, indeed even ennobled, when they go beyond what they might be able to do for themselves on behalf of the client. The, the quotidian place I think this happens is discovery letters. I, I think most lawyers who write vituperative discovery letters filled with, filled with accusations of bad faith and, and misrepresentation and things like that are saying things that they would never say in real life on behalf of themselves to someone else. But because they are representing their client and are supposed to do so zealously, all of a sudden the sense of altruism kicks in and seems to validate this extreme behavior. All right, there's also another cultural norm. That's that lawyers make arguments. We make arguments to justify why in a particular situation behavior was correct. We all know rules aren't absolute. We all know deviations can be justified. None of us want the cop to give a ticket to the spouse who's driving a, a, a pregnant uh, woman to the hospital to give birth. And a litigator's job in particular is to make arguments. A deal lawyer's job is to make arguments to convince the other side. All of these skills enable lawyers to rationalize their own departures from the rules. And what, again, the psychological research shows is the better you are at making these types of arguments, the better you are at this type of rationalization. So here, I actually think we have something that maps on well with, with the big firm problem. What we have at, at, at big firms is elite makers of arguments. We have elite rationalizers. And so it's not at all surprising that they would be able to use those same skills to rationalize their own decisions. We also, of course, have uh, firm-specific cultural norms. Some firms are, are more aggressive than others. They pride themselves on being aggressive. That plays in uh, to uh, the analysis. Now I'd like to talk about a lawyer's past actions. We all know about the, the slippery slope. A related term is, is ethical fading. The basic idea here is that early and small action, transgressions establish a new norm that makes it easier to transgress on uh, uh, future occasions to a greater degree. I think we can see that in the ACORN scenario as well. And I wonder how this type of slippery slope behavior and the, the lessons learned from early behavior will play out in the life of that associate who reported up the line on the Shirwani conversation. What that associate learned is that they reported something that was, they viewed as a serious problem and that it got brushed off. It was quite quickly viewed as not a problem. We don't know how the associate internalized that result. We don't know if the associate will now think that that is the norm, that that is what should be done. Or perhaps that associate will think when I have the same situation come up in the future, I won't do that. But this, uh, the, the, the concept of the slippery slope and the concept of ethical fading uh, suggests that uh, it's more likely to be the former. Now, what flattens the slippery slope and what induces positive behavior 
is when early deviations are corrected. This can happen internally, it can happen internally at a firm with a good mentorship program where these types of things are corrected. And it can also happen externally through uh, uh, disciplinary action uh, or through court action. But here we have another problem. The state bar associations, the state disciplinary council have not been vigorous in pursuing uh, uh, actions, particularly against big firm lawyers. They don't like to get involved in litigation in litigated situations. And the courts generally stand aside as well. In Delaware, for example, the Delaware Supreme Court has made clear that policing ethical behavior is a job for the Delaware Supreme Court and the Office of Disciplinary Counsel. A trial court only addresses these issues if they are so extreme as to affect the ultimate fairness of the proceeding. And that has the positive effect of helping limit the amount of the extent to which litigation descends into ethical name calling, but it also removes a potential check on ethical misconduct by lawyers. All right. So, so far, uh, I've given you some reasons why um, we may not have a bunch of psychopaths out there running big law. And let's face it, that's a good thing. That's the good news of this explanation. The bad news is that we now have a problem that is very difficult to fix because the problem depends on people identifying these situations in real time, on self-policing, it depends on establishing norms, uh, and it depends on uh, 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 people essentially checking their own behavior. Behavioral account, I think, also creates knock-on difficulties for courts. Because what we're dealing with now is a situation where people can, can honestly say with some degree of conviction that they didn't act intentionally in a wrongful way. They just didn't see it. And so even if the behavior is seemingly beyond the pale, uh, there's a, 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 an understandable explanation about how the person could have released, re reached that point. So I think it's time to give you a little bit of a hopeful turn. I realize that I'm speaking to an audience predominantly comprised of lawyers and future lawyers. Some of you may now be depressed and considering uh, alternative career paths. Uh, please don't do that. My purpose is not to depress you. My purpose is to sound an alarm, provide a cautionary tale and motivate you. My, my purpose is to ensure that you are on the lookout for these types of situations and aren't cut, caught unawares. Practice works, preparation works. If you think it through in advance what you will do when you take, face an ethically fraught situation, you will be more likely to recognize the danger and deal with it in a forthright way. You need to think in advance about the lines you won't cross, even if there are gonna be personal consequences for you uh, in your firm or for your career. When I was in practice, I always told my colleagues that we had to be ready to fire the client. Some clients are trouble. Some clients will ask you to do things that you can't or, or should be unwilling to do. And it's always better to fire the client than start down that slippery slope. Next, find a supportive community. It will be easier for you to identify these issues and to do the right thing if you don't feel like you're the only one doing this. I strongly encourage you to consider the American Inns of Court movement. Uh, they were started in the late 1980s to promote civility. They focus on these types of issues. They, they give you a, a community of practitioners in which you can talk about these things and where uh, these types of norms are reinforced. It's also an excellent way to meet other lawyers in your community. I think part of what happens here is in the practice of the law, there's a dehumanizing fact for the uh, dehumanizing aspect for how you view the other side. If you have interacted with that colleague outside of litigation, you are more likely uh, to deal with a situation well uh, than otherwise. And finally, from the specific cautionary tale of the Acorn case, please sensitize yourself to the idea of a colleague treating concealment as the right response. Uh, there's the old saying uh, from politics, from Watergate, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. 
That is completely true in litigation. What you are handing someone when you hand them a cover up is they get not only to litigate the underlying wrong, they get to litigate your credibility and you never want to hand them that ticket. And finally, I believe that in addition to lawyers having this role and hopefully you all having this role, courts have a role. I think we have to set standards. I think we have to try to maintain those standards. I think we have to be an instrument of value transmission. So when I think about why I described the behavior in these cases in detail, it's because it affected the outcome of the case and because it was something that shouldn't be swept under the rug. So for my part, I will continue to describe lawyer misbehavior when I see it and when it's relevant to the outcome. And I will continue to rely on Louis Brandeis's teaching that sunlight remains the best disinfectant. So thank you all for your time today. It's been good to be with you and I appreciate it. Yeah, I'll take a couple questions. I will moderate the Q&A. Who has questions? Yeah. Um, so I know you mentioned with the Acorn case that there was one director who had experience with the FDA and kind of brought it to their attention. Do you think the fact that the board of directors has kind of lost a lot of their power over big corporations and don't really play the monitoring role that they used to has some effect where the, the managers of the corporation are able to kind of direct counsel to do things that like an independent body of board, like a board that should be independent, would it direct them to do it? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to repeat the, the question. So I understood the question to be um, pointing out the fact that one of the directors in Acorn flagged uh, this issue is potentially problematic. And so the question was asking uh, whether uh, uh, a lack of independence or distance on the part of the board uh, allows um, management to potentially uh, create problems. Um, I think that definitely can be a dynamic. Uh, I think that as a general matter, particularly uh, in the Fortune 500 companies, um, directors are, are generally uh, quite independent. Uh, in fact, if anything, the argument is being advanced that they're, they're too independent and that they're distanced from the company's operations. Um, I think the, the, the real issue, which you've put your finger on, uh, is the question of information flow. Um, and because the directors are, are, are part-time, and I, and I say that recognizing that they devote significant time to their job, but they are not the equivalent of full-time managers. They're not at the company uh, day in and day out. They don't have independent uh, sources of information. Typically, that informational nexus uh, uh, by which the board receives information is coming uh, through management. And it is true uh, that if uh, management has the closer role or the longtime role with the advisors, uh, be they a longtime counsel or even a deal-specific counsel, uh, that can also uh, affect it. So uh, that's, that's where I think the concern lies. Uh, I think directors are, are generally trying to do the right thing. I think they're capable of doing the right thing. Uh, I think that when we see uh, boards get into problems, it's because they haven't been presented with the information or more likely they've been presented with the information that has been spun or, or packaged in a way that it doesn't uh, seem as significant. Uh, so bottom line, I would tell you that the, the board retains the power to do something. They retain the ability to do something. I think they're often willing to do something. The question is just whether they're receiving the information that is necessary for them to do something. Other oh, questions? Yeah. I wonder if you think zealous partisanship is a problem in itself, or if we can go on living the way we have been, thinking we are zealous partisans, but maybe we should just be a little stricter about our own morals? Or do you think there's a sense in which we need to think differently about what it means to be a zealous partisan? Yeah, so for the, for the folks on Zoom, the, the question was really geared towards uh, the adjective zealous and uh, whether I perceive a problem uh, with the idea of being a zealous advocate uh, uh, and that, that mindset. So I was careful to say in my remarks, I hope that um, it, it was a perceived norm of zealous uh, advocacy. Um, when, you when you really look at the, the model rules, um, the, the idea of zealousness uh, uh, shows up in the introduction. It shows up in the introductory comments. 
it doesn't actually show up in any of the rules. And when you read the, 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 the history surrounding the drafting of the model rules, that was intentional. They were actually trying to get away from this idea of zealous uh, as, a, as an overarching concept. I also think that the, the word zealous suffers from um, its close relationship with zealotry, uh, which actually isn't you know, etymologically correct. I mean, zealous really just means vigorous. It doesn't mean go out there and be um, you know, unthinking uh, like a zealot and get everything uh, that you can. But I think that's how it gets interpreted. Um, and you know, my, my personal view is that extremism in any form is bad. Uh, and I think, yes, um, this type of, of, of mindset, the mindset of zealousness, I think is a dangerous mindset. Uh, I, I would like to see a, you know, a mindset of, of, of reasonableness. I would like to see a, a mindset that, that takes into account uh, a recognition for the, the interests that the other side has, uh, particularly in the litigation context. Uh, we in Delaware regularly stress that attorneys are officers of the court. Uh, and again, when you get to the authority on this, the, the responsibility of officer of the court takes precedence because you have been empowered by the state with a specific license to practice law that lets you do something that nobody else can do. And with that comes these responsibilities. And one of these responsibilities is to act as an officer of the court and to help achieve justice. So I, I absolutely think that if we could somehow wipe the concept of zealous from the collective memory of the legal profession, we would be much better off. And short of that, if we could somehow internalize the norm that the first and most important priority a lawyer should have should be to this notion of justice and helping the legal system work and get to the right answers, uh, that to me would be a uh, a second best solution if we can't get rid of the Z word. But exercise the moderator's privilege and take you back to the slippery slope argument. If you think about the cravat deterrence problems, let's say you're right that when the whistleblower letters show up, they say to the board, well, it's obvious you need to go do an internal investigation. And they get the answer, no, we're not doing that. So you can imagine the attorney thinking that was a rather imprudent decision on their part, but there's nothing dishonest about it, really, in itself. And then they get the assignment I want you to front run the other guy's investigation, for Sonia's investigation. Also, not in itself wrong. It's not in itself wrong for me to get to the, my employees first and find out what they're going to tell for Sonia's. That's okay too. But when I start modifying what they're going to say, and I said, well, you don't have to tell them that, right? Why don't you phrase it this way? So I said, things like that started to happen. Now we've moved into concealment, right? And I would note, right, if you look at the standard for fraud under 10b5 or the common law, it says misstating a material fact or omitting to state something that makes what you had said in the light of the circumstances in which it was made not misleading, you could conceivably just comply with your 10b5 standard and still conceal. Yes. Right? And now once you conceal and now you're unethical, now you're across the line but you might not know it. Yes. Right? And then you've concealed more and more and more things. And finally, you're in a situation of a very bad situation of your own making. And there's a wonderful Henry Friendly decision where he says, you know, desperate men in a bad situation of their own making are not fully rational. And then you actually go lie to the FDA. I, I, I honestly think that, you know, I think that is how these things happen. Um, and I think when, you know, the, the, the corporate scholars, your colleagues who have, who have looked into fraud, um, there are, the major Ponzi schemes, there are true fraudsters out there, but much of corporate fraud happens through this slippery slope. It happens through this escalation of commitment. It happens through a, you know, an initial accounting violation, an additional accounting decision that is aggressive 
but not problematic, expecting to make the money back in the next quarter so that you won't have to worry about it. Um, then another quarter comes, another quarter comes, you have to push a little bit more. Um, and I think this, this same thing happens in the legal community. Um, and look, this, this is not easy. I'm not suggesting that it's easy. And that's part of the reason why I think it's so important that we all be aware of it. Um, because the easy path, the easy path is this incremental escalation of commitment to the outcome that you end up with. The easy path is to go downhill uh, along the, the slippery slope. The, the tougher thing is, is to stop yourself midway. Other questions? I have a question about a, a real case, but might, might be a little relevant to the topic today, may I ask? Sure. Uh, this is a real case happened several years ago, and it's a simple stock purchase case, and happened in 2018. The negotiation and signing part was completely in, completed in 2018, and the closing part is divided into two parts. And first part is 60% of the share and uh, where the, the buyer shall pay the fixed amount of money within like one month of signing. But the second part is in uh, March, by the end of March, 2021. And the price of which shall be determined by the net earnings of the 2020. But the question is, this target company is a medical company and one major business is to manufacture the products relevant to COVID-19 tests. So as you can see, the, the net earning is like six or seven times than uh, 2019. And so the seller simply wants to terminate the second part deal. And I, I don't know the final verdict because this, this, this case is arbitrated in Hong Kong. But my question is, uh, if I were the, if we were the lawyer representing the seller, uh, the buyer, sorry, um, what shall we do to prevent such situation? Uh, would MAC or MAE clause helpful to terminate the second part? And even after the dispute arises, um, because the the buyer is is a listed company, they can they have money to to close the second deal, but they simply don't want that because they, yeah. they think it's too expensive. But they are still able to complete it. So what shall we to what shall we to do to advise them? Hmm. Well, the short answer is I don't know. Um, <laughs> the 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 longer answer is that you know judges can't give legal advice, which gets me out of a lot of things. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, it sounds like what you needed at the, at the beginning was, was the equivalent of a pricing collar, um, where you, know, you would essentially define the merger consideration in some way, the back end consideration in some way, so that was formula driven and was you know, capped at an upper limit or capped at a bottom limit so that there would be some certainty uh, around the around that range, uh, and then you would have you know, rights if if things went out of that range. Um, you know the problem you have is nobody anticipates. There are always going to be things in the deal situation that nobody anticipates. You need a you need a material beneficial exactly. Cost. That's exactly what you need. You need a material benefit cost exactly. Um, but yeah, there the this is the other issue about you know contract drafting. Um, there are always gonna be things that we can't foresee because contracting is costly, human cognition is limited. Uh, no matter how long people sit around and think about things, they're not gonna be able to sit around and come up with every possibility and they're not gonna be able to draft for every possibility. So there, were, there will always be holes in the agreement. This is also a benefit of, of using precedent because Precedent over time accretes. And the reason we have 80 to 100 page merger agreements today is because even if you can't remember what the purpose of this one provision was, somebody put it in after a problem happened and it's lived on there to deal with that unforeseen circumstance that you uh, uh, might not have, have thought about if you were just uh, starting from scratch. So 
I mean, I, I would give you a little bit of encouragement in that it's, it's not clear to me that you should beat yourself up for not thinking about these things. People will always not think about things. Um, you know, but a, some form of, of, of material change provision uh, would be the type of thing that one might think about in that setting, either on a standalone or based on the type of collar concept I was talking about. Please uh, join me in thanking Vice Chancellor Lyon. We have a reception to you outside in the hall. Please come join us and the vice chair will be happy to continue to speak with you.